and welcome everyone to our webinar today on uh, protecting and defending your Active Directory uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, for those of you that have uh, listened in on any of my webinars in the past, um, I typically have kind of three main strategies for how to protect and defend against very sophisticated attacks. Um, and, uh, you know, these, uh, I kind of break them down into, you know, kind of the first strategy is all about, you know, uh, you know, proper, you know, putting proper protections in place, kind of those basic protections for uh, your infrastructure and devices, things like firewalls and et cetera. Uh, you know, making sure that the devices are properly configured um, based on kind of security best practices, and then making sure those devices are, you know, properly in, continuously updated and patched against the latest and greatest um, vulnerabilities. And I bundle all these together into what I call good cyber hygiene. Um, the second strategy has to do with um, using proactive measures to detect and respond to attacks within your infrastructure. So this is essentially, uh, you know, under the assumption that your basic protections won't be sufficient, that the attackers will, you know, in their endless creativity, will find a way to get past those defenses. And so you need to be able to quickly detect their presence and be able to block their advance within your environment. And um, and then uh, the third area is having a, you know, kind of well-rehearsed um, incident response plan within your organization. Uh, you know, this ensures that everybody's on the same page and uh, can, you know, quickly uh, jump in and, and respond, uh, you know, appropriately if, if you're under attack. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about uh, protecting and defending Active Directory, I'll, I'll kind of put an AD spin on these three themes. I'll kind of, uh, kind of wicker things uh, slightly differently, put them in different buckets, but you'll, you'll see these three themes kind of uh, jumping out as we get into the presentation. So, so for today, we'll be talking about you know, just that, how do we protect and defend our Active Directory infrastructures? Uh, and then I will turn it over to um, Arid, who will be doing a um, live uh, attack simulation uh, of Active Directory specific attacks and kind of show the, the various tools um, that attackers use and also uh, the tools that can be used uh, on the defender side to be able to actively defend against these attacks. All right, so uh, just to make sure, uh, you know, we're uh, kind of level set, make sure we're all uh, on the same page here. Uh, when we talk about Active Directory, it's really an umbrella that covers lots of different Active Directory services. And uh, the major ones are listed here in the, the center of the bullseye or the second ring of the, the bullseye uh, diagram. Uh, the main one being domain services, which are kind of all the key things that uh, you know, support Active Directory and make sure that, uh, you know, your systems are all, uh, you know, kind of configured uh, in a synchronized way and that you can kind of manage the overall counts. Um, this is uh, uh, supported by certificate services, which manage things like PKI certificates uh, that support secure communications. It's supported by federation services that support things like single sign-on so that you can have a single set of active directory credentials, uh, work across lots of different types of systems and, um, and uh, uh, next one being rights management services, which is all about um, sort of how do you protect and control access to data. And so a key aspect here would be to have things like conditional um, data access policies that would say, you know, uh, so very specific things about how that data can be accessed and, and sort of under what conditions. And then uh, directory services, lightweight directory services, kind of the back end database that keeps everything uh, together. But if we kind of take that to the next level, to the very highest level, it's really around uh, providing three basic uh, sets of capabilities. The first one being centralized policy management, which is, is you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's really about keeping everything synchronized, uh, being able to push out enterprise level policies to all your devices so that they're all configured based on your enterprise policies. So things like group policy objects would fit under here. Uh, access and privilege management, uh, you know, this is about maintaining the accounts within your system. So those could be user accounts, uh, privilege user accounts, uh, service accounts, et cetera, and being able to establish privileges um, for those accounts and maintain those privileges, um, you know, to be able to restrict what each of those accounts is able to access. And then uh, authentication and authorization, which is essentially the gatekeeper that takes all of that information and and uh, make sure that when somebody tries to access a system that they are uh, sort of authenticated so that they are who they claim to be and 
and uh, you know that they, uh, based on their privileges, they were authorized to do certain things on um, the specific systems. Um, so, um, so as you can, you know, easily see here, Active Directory is very central to any type of a Windows infrastructure. Um, and if you can get access to Active Directory, you truly can get a, have the keys to the kingdom. Uh, and so because of that, Active Directory becomes a very high priority target for attackers. You know, they love to get access to Active Directory. And once they've gained access to Active Directory, they tend to be able to do a lot of damage. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, later. All right. So how do they get access? And so when we talk about initially getting access to AD, they tend to do that in three different ways. Uh, the key way or the prime way being phishing and social engineering attacks. Um, this tends to be their go-to technique because it's very effective. It, it works. It works a lot of the times. Uh, you know, people click on a link and uh, or or provide some information in response to a phishing email, and um, you know uh, that allows their uh, the, the attackers to essentially steal their credentials or gain access to their account, and that gives them that foothold. Um, but they also um, uh, will, you know, attempt to compromise credentials. You know, they can try and brute force the password, try and guess what your password is by just trying lots of combinations of passwords. Uh, they may use password spraying accounts where they'll uh, take a compromised password and just try it on lots of systems to see if you use that same set of credentials on another system. Uh, they may have a key logger installed on the system that allows them to capture those credentials. Um, and then the kind of the final way is just going ahead head to head with Active Directory and just compromising the actual Active Directory systems themselves. So this could be through an unpatched vulnerability or say a zero day attack, something that the uh, uh, that we don't have, um, you know, detections in place for um, quite yet. All right. So, you know, kind of once they gain that initial fo foothold, they're going to want to expand their access. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so they'll start out by using that account that they compromise, they'll masquerade as a legitimate user on your account, but they'll quickly want to uh, try and either, um, you know, get access to other systems or to move from, say, a general user account to a privileged account where they have, uh, you know, greater access into the systems. And, uh, you know, once they've kind of expanded their access, they're probably going to put some remote access in place, uh, put some persistence in place to uh you know ensure that they can get back into the system if that account is uh, say locked out um you know from there they're going to move laterally and try and compromise other resources and ultimately they're looking for either uh critical systems that uh, are vital to your business operations or they're looking for sensitive data that they can use to essentially uh, you know uh, ransom and, and extort you for um, for payment uh, and then finally, uh, you know, if they have privileged access to the system, they can go in and cover their tracks. Um, and that's usually something that attackers like to do. Uh, once again, they want to try and maintain that access as long as they can. All right. So uh, so why is it so hard to defend Active Directory against attacks? And, uh, you know, the first is, you know, when they have compromised somebody's um, account, uh, they're logging in as that legitimate user of your infrastructure. And because of that, they have implied trust within your systems. The, the system recognizes them as a valid user, um, and it allows them to do whatever they're authorized to do based on the privileges that you've assigned to that account. Uh, so because of this, they can blend into the background, and it can make it very challenging to actually detect their presence within the environment. Um, the next is just the evolving nature of threats. I mean, attackers are endlessly creative in finding new ways into systems, and so just keeping up with the latest and greatest uh, AD-based attacks uh, can be challenging. Uh, when we talk about complexity, it's really kind of uh, two two key aspects here. One is the complexity of your environment. Uh, you know, many folks are running on-premise systems. They have a, a presence in one or more cloud infrastructures where they uh, sort of migrated things into a cloud. Uh, you know, they're probably leveraging uh, third-party SaaS services, things like you know Microsoft 365, and that's integrated tightly into their environment. Uh, they may have connectivity with um, third party partners. And um, and so all of that complexity makes it uh, very challenging to, uh, you know, uh, keep tabs on who has access to what across that very complex environment. And, you know, key, you know, for us folks that are providing IT services to our, you know, our employees, and to our companies is we want to make it 
easy and seamless for our users to access. So we, we're trying to make it easy and seamless, but all this complexity in the background can can make that very challenging. And then, you know, overlaying that is just the complexity of the AD infrastructure that you need to manage a very complex environment. You have lots of trust set up between different um, Active Directory domains, and, uh, you know, those can all be um, points for an attacker to, to move from one system into another. Um, Next, uh, insider threats. This is kind of closely related to Im implied trust. Uh, you know, once an attacker gains access to the environment, they really become an insider. And, you know, insiders, as we know, can do a lot of damage within our system. They're trusted users of the environment. Uh, we tend to give them, you know, we tend to trust them and give them privileges. And, and because of that, insiders can do damage. And so an attacker acting as an insider can do a lot of damage. Um, uh, the next is... Um, you know, kind of the, the stealthy types of attacks that can occur with Active Directory. Um, uh, you know, a lot of these are referred to as uh, living off the land types of techniques. And so, you know, when somebody attacks Active Directory, they have a valid account. Uh, you know, they'll probably look around to see if there are tools already on the network that they can use to uh, further attack the environment. Maybe there's scanning tools there that your IT department uh, has in place. Uh, you know, there's PowerShell and other things that they can use. And, uh, you know, by living off the land and using the tools that exist within the environment, uh, you know, they don't tip off the defenders, uh, you know, of their presence by installing new tools that might be detected. They're essentially using what's there, and that can make it very difficult to detect their presence. Um, limited contextual understanding. This is about uh, really understanding what normal is for your network so that you can detect what's abnormal. And so when we talk about active directory based attacks, uh, usually they're detected by detecting uh, abnormalities or just unusual, um, suspicious things when you, in your network. Uh, and so the contextual understanding is important by building that, uh, you know, that uh, kind of view of what normal is in your network so that you know when things are starting to act abnormally and you can um, start to investigate that. So, um, and most folks, um, don't necessarily have the tools in place to do that anomaly based detection and be able to track um, kind of normal within their network. And then finally, I kind of alluded to this already. Uh, generally, AD based attacks tend to have very long dwell times. I mean, they're, they're kind of blending in with normal network traffic. They can be very difficult to detect. Uh, and so attackers with Active Directory uh, access tend to uh, dwell within your environment for a long period of time. And because of that, uh, they can do a lot of damage. All right. So how do we protect and defend uh, Active Directory? Um, uh, I kind of break it down into three uh, general strategies. One is continuous visibility, the other being configuration compliance or really that good cyber hygiene, make sure everything's properly uh, configured um, and stays properly configured within the environment and then proactive uh, detection and response. And we're going to dive into each of these areas. So visibility. So visibility is always important in your network. It uh, really understand how your network's configured, how things are connected, uh, where you have exposure to the internet, et cetera. Uh, and it's, it's really important as well for uh, protecting and defending Active Directory. But when we talk about visibility, uh, in this case, we really need to have visibility into things that are important within Active Directory. And so uh, not surprisingly, the user accounts are very important. So having visibility into those user accounts, you know, what accounts you have, what privileges they have, uh, you know, and particularly looking for changes to those accounts, either new accounts being created that you really can't explain why that account's created or, or uh, you know, memberships changing, et cetera. So being able to have visibility and track what's going on from your user accounts. Um, similarly, um, with an Active Directory, they kind of divide things up um, and the lowest level of organization within Active Directory is what's called organizational units or OUs. Uh, so this is the lowest level grouping of a set of resources that are all kind of related and need to communicate together, for example. And so, um, you know, attackers like to go in and, and sort of change what, uh, you know, groups or, or OUs or domains things are attached to uh, so that they can, you know, uh, try and expand their access. And so being able to track kind of what normal is from your OUs to be able to, to do change detection there is, is important. Um, you know, we talked about uh, group, policy group policy objects and, you know, the kind of that ability to um, have enterprise policies that are pushed out to all your devices. So obviously having, you know, good visibility of what your policies are being pushed out to the devices 
and understanding if those policies comply with your enterprise policy and and security best practices is an important thing to do. Uh, you know, monitoring and having uh, visibility into uh, the events that are being uh, generated within Active Directory logs is, is a, a good source of, of visibility on what's going on in your Active Directory um, environment. And then finally, uh, you know, there's lots of uh, replication that occurs within Active Directory, uh, you know, to keep things synchronized. And so just kind of being having good visibility into uh, how things are being replicated uh, throughout your environment. Uh, is a good way to kind of track, particularly if if uh, attackers are making changes, uh, understanding how those changes might have uh, replicated and pushed out to other devices uh, gives you a good heads up into um, how other devices may have been compromised um, if they're, you know, have gained access into your Active Directory. All right. So the next area, you know, also kind of in the realm of uh, good cyber hygiene is uh, just making sure things are properly configured and that they comply with your enterprise policies and comply with enterprise uh, best practice. So being able to uh, kind of detect when things fall out of compliance with your uh, your policies. And so um, a couple of key things here are uh, kind of the first two, which is all about, um, you know, making sure that your active directory infrastructure is uh, adequately isolated from the rest of your in environment. So understanding what connectivity you have in and out of Active Directory and being able to segment off and kind of firewall off your Active Directory infrastructure to limit the risk there um, and making sure that it's updated and patched properly so that you're protected against the latest and greatest vulnerabilities. Um, you know, uh, administrative accounts are kind of the holy grail for an attacker. If they can get access to an admin account, then they generally have an account with lots of privileges and lots of access. So um, so they try and go after those accounts. So uh, making sure that those admin accounts are well configured, um, you know, so understanding what admin accounts you have, um, understanding, you know, uh, and making sure that they're accessing they're able to access the systems they need for that admin to do their job, but they don't have unnecessary access in place. Make sure that you have uh, multi-factor authentication configured for those admins accounts. Make sure you have good things in place like, um, you know, uh, complex hard to get passwords in place uh, with those um, admin accounts. Um, and kind of tied to that is, you know, you know making sure that you're uh, that you're aligned with the the principle of least privilege. So making sure that all the accounts within your environment have the privileges they need to do their job, but don't have excess privileges. And, you know, this can be challenging when you have employees that move around quite a bit because we tend to give them the new privileges they need, but not necessarily go back and clean up old privileges. So, uh, you know, long tenured employees tend to have a lot of privileges. And, uh, and so this just adds risk from an attack standpoint if one of those uh, very privileged accounts is compromised. And then, you know, uh, you know, policy is very important um, across the board. And so, you know, the ones across the bottom are all kind of related to policy. And it's just important to make sure that those policies are sound, um, you know, that that all of the devices are updated with those policies. So that if you're pushing out those policies that they actually stuck on the devices um, that, that you push the policy out to, et cetera. All right. And then, uh, you know, kind of the third uh, gear here is uh, proactive detection and response. Uh, and when we talk about Active Directory, the things that I think are key there is, um, you know, first being um, understanding the risk of various um, uh, Active Directory infrastructure devices within your infrastructure. And so, uh, you know, once again, as I mentioned earlier, understanding what those AD devices are connected to, you know, how exposed are they to the internet? Uh, do they have the latest patches, uh, et cetera, applied? Um, and so, uh, you know, all of this can be kind of brought together and uh, you can assign risk to different devices. So by doing um, continuous risk profiling, it's a good way to um, kind of tee up to your defenders devices that have fallen out of compliance and now have a lot of risk associated with it so that they can go in and take a look at those devices, figure out what's going on and get them back into compliance and kind of lower the risk associated with those devices. And really the only way to do that is to track risk in real time so that you can understand um, when those changes occur that, that, that change that risk profile. Uh, the next is being able to monitor network traffic, specifically looking for AD-based attacks within your network traffic. And, you know, 
the challenge here is, you know, that, you know, having the sensors in the right place to be able to detect what's going on in the more traditional sort of corporate enterprise environment, uh, say on-prem, but also being able to monitor what's, um, you know, going on within your cloud environments or, you know, coming and going from third parties or, or third party SaaS services and being able to, to drill down and look in that traffic for AD specific attacks. And the, the key here is to detect those attacks early uh, before you know that attacker has gained a foothold, so being able to monitor that, that attract that traffic and alert your defenders that that there are some AD based um, attacks in your traffic is important. Uh, monitoring and auditing, particularly of AD logs, um, you know that's obviously important to be able to to look for those events that seem anomalous or suspicious. And then um, something that's um, somewhat unique um, and probably not. Uh, deployed in a lot of places is to have uh, deception capabilities that are specific to AD. And, uh, you know, this can act as the uh, canary in the coal mine, give you early indication that your AD is under attack. And so essentially uh, what we're talking about here is having AD specific um, deception decoys within your infrastructure, uh, having uh, what we call uh, breadcrumbs or juicy pieces of information, maybe, uh, you know, admin credentials in the clear sitting in a file somewhere that um, attackers will stumble over and it will lure them to, towards this deception uh, environment. And, and the key here is uh, when you have an attacker interacting with deception decoys, that's a very high confidence, very actionable alert. And it's, it's you know, pretty much 100% that your Active Directory is under attack. So um, it's a good way to detect and, and quickly be able to uh, block attacks against Active Directory. And then, uh, you know, to the right, uh, automated threat detection. So once again, uh, you know, advanced threat detection that can detect those AD specific attacks. And the key here is being able to, you know, kind of pull from these four boxes on the left, be able to integrate what you're seeing uh, and what's kind of firing within those other blocks and being able to correlate events between those different blocks to be able to uh, be able to detect uh, these very stealthy attacks. Um, and then, you know, as we've talked about multiple times, being able to quickly respond to attacks, so automated response capabilities. All right, so um, so I'm, I'm very excited um, to uh, be able to kind of announce that um, Fidelis has rolled out a new product line, what we call Fidelis Active Directory Intercept. Um, and this uh, combines uh, some 80 specific um, capabilities that we've developed with our Fidelis network and our Fidelis deception capabilities. Uh, to really kind of give that an integrated um, uh, view and be able to monitor in an integrated uh, way uh, what's going on across your environment and looking for those very stealthy, hard to detect active directory attacks. And so um, some of the key things here are we have um, capabilities that uh, will pull from the AD configuration and the AD logs to uh, provide your defenders with um, an AD health check. So essentially looking at the key parameters within AD and providing um, a health check against those so that your defenders can look for things that um, are not configured based on uh, security best practices. Uh, being able to specifically look at AD logs and combine those with what we're seeing in other places within the network to be able to once again detect those more stealthy attacks. Um, sorry the right build thing, uh, combining that with some AD specific detections that we've built into our network detection response capability to be able to look for those attacks coming across the wire before they become a problem. And then finally, um, extensions that we've built into our deception capabilities that have AD specific um, decoys and breadcrumbs. So we're very excited about this. We think um, it's important uh, new capability and really uh, something that is somewhat unique in the industry um, you know, particularly when we combine uh, network and uh, deception with Active Directory uh, detection tools. All right, so with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Arid, who's going to uh, uh, do some attack simulations for, on some AD-based uh, attacks. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I'm gonna demonstrate some uh, simulations, some uh, four Active Directory attacks. In particular, I'm gonna show a Kerberosing attack, a LSAS dump from LSAS memory, a, some user enumeration using open source Kerber boot tool from GitHub, DC sync using Mimikatz, 
and the idea is to show you a the attack and b how we use a multi-layer uh, defense strategy to catch the attackers so we can use deception we can use uh, traffic analysis we can use the logs sometimes we're using one or two or all the elements together to uh, kind of uh, complement uh, each other so we can start so the first attack I'm going to speak about uh, is uh, Kerberos thing. So before jumping into the attack, I'm going to speak a bit about the uh, Kerberos protocol. Kerberos is an authentication protocol in uh, AD environment. Um, part of is the part of uh, the protocol. The protocol uh, uses SPN, which are a service principal name, are, are essentially strings that identify services. So for, uh, for example, for RDP or VNC or WinRM, any of the services are going to have a, a unique SPN to uh, identify them. Usually in Active Directory environment, computer object will have a SPN configured, whereas user will not have. There is one special case when, where users will have a SPN configured to them. This special, special case is when uh, users are uh, called service users. What are service users? Service users are special users that services uh, as piece of software around your uh, environment uses these um, users to authenticate to another service. Let's give an example. So imagine that you have a client, um, some software that need to access SQL servers to read some data. If you all working in, in the same AD environment and you will use Kerberos, you will need to configure a user account. You, you will need to give this user account a permission to access the, um, the SQL service, uh, servers, and you need to configure this user to have SPN to identify him as a service users. When you do it, when you configure a service user, you make him vulnerable to attack uh, uh, named Kerberos thing. In Kerberos, part of uh, part of the working of the protocol is to transfer tickets between a client to the domain controller to the server. The ticket, many a few type of tickets are being transferred from the, all the machines involved to prove identity. Uh, when service user is created, the service ticket in Kerberos is encrypted with the password hash of the service users. What it means, it means that anyone in the domain that grab the service ticket can try to brute force on offline uh, the password hash. So what is Kerberosing attack? Kerberosing attack is a scanning of the network, usually using LDAP for uh, service users. By default, by definition, any normal user in the account, when I'm saying normal, I'm saying not a, not a disabled users, any new user you create, even low privilege account, can surge, have a read LDAP um, capabilities in, uh, in, uh, the, in the domain. So any um, low privilege account can surge, can scan all the network for service users. Whenever the attacker find those service users, he can ask for service ticket for them. From the service ticket, uh, the attacker is going to grab the password hash of the service user. And then later on, usually offline, try to brute force using high CPU or GPU. Uh, millions can be millions or a type of um, password in order to try to uh, brute force um, uh, try to boot for the password. So let's uh, let's see some uh, example. Let's see how it looks in a real environment. Okay. So uh, here I'm um, I'm going to run a, a tool named uh, Parasploit. So if you Google in GitHub, if you just Google Kerberos thing uh, uh, space GitHub, you're going to find many open source tools. Let's run it and see the, the output. So what uh, the tool do essentially is, is scanning for uh, the network for uh, Active Directory service users. Uh, and when it, 
Okay. And whenever he found them, he asked for a service ticket for them and extract the hash uh, from the users. So we can see here that I found a username. For example, I found few username. I found few, uh, you can see here, another username. Uh, I found the hashes for this uh, username. What I'm going to do now, usually offline, because I don't want to be suspicious to raise some uh, alerts, for suspicious activity, I'm going to transfer this file outside, and my in in an offline machine, the attacker can easily uh, brute force the attack. In, I'm going to give, show you an example for one tool that it, that it used to brute forcing the attack. They brute force the password. Uh, the tool is called uh, John the Ripper. Again, it's an open source tool. Uh, what the tool does, uh, it can brute force uh, offline uh, brute force the hash against many um, many type of a uh, password. In my case, I provided the tool uh, a, a dictionary of very common uh, password. And I can see in this file what I managed to uh, brute force. I can see I got some uh, usernames, admin, and user. And I can see on the right the password that I managed uh, to brute force. So this is the, an example of, uh, of the attack. Uh, what my challenge is as a defender? How, how I'm going to detect this, um, this attack? So LDAP sometimes can be encrypted. If I use LDAP S, it's just LDAP over SSL or other types of encryption over LDAP. In addition, if you ever looked and analyzed logs in the domain controller, there are many Kerberos even in a small uh, domain, there's many logs uh, related to Kerberos, which make it very difficult uh, to detect. Here, uh, I'm showing you uh, some of the tools that use Kerberosing on the wire, how it looks if I open Wireshark and analyze the traffic. In the first picture, you can see the uh, data not encrypted. And in the second picture, you can find it uh, encrypted. So uh, let's uh, see what's happening in the first picture. You can see that the filter is for some account type with a number and a service principal name with a wildcard. What it says in simple terms, the attacker is looking for a account of type users and uh, that have a service principal name configured, which means just show me all the service users in the environment. So this is the first leg of the attack. In the second picture, it's another tool that do, does exactly the same as we, ju we just showed, but the uh, payload is encrypted. So how we detect what we do in this case? Uh, it's just an example of the attack. We can see the, again, the password. So whenever the data is not encrypted, we flag the, the suspicious queries, a query that just, we have dozens of queries that we identify with a high chance of, um, of malicious queries, some scanning, as we saw, scanning for passwords. So in this case, it's an actual alert from the product, how we, uh, got, um, how we got and detected a suspicious query. But in other cases, when the, um, when the uh, data is encrypted, when LDAP is encrypted, we're going to use another type of strategy. What we're going to do is we're going to use deception. We're going, we'll configure, uh, we'll see it later on in the product, we will configure uh, DECO users, which essentially are um, Active Directory usernames, and we're going to configure a service principal name for these users. So whenever an attacker will um, try to ask for service ticket for these users, we're going to detect. This is the second stage of the attacker, as you, as you remember. It's grabbing, asking for the service ticket. Usually, all the tools, um, usually all the tools in the, uh, that use care boosting are, are scanning the network for, for all the um, service users. Whenever a customer of us will use a deception, some of the uh, service principal name will be decoys. So we, we will see a multiple, a, a, a multiple alerts for a deception a activity. So this is a, was the first a, a example. 
we can move on to the next uh, attack. The next attack is uh, uh, Elsas Dam. Elsas is a memory part of the authentication uh, process that is used in a Windows environment. And among of its many things, it's the, the process is storing a um, recently logged on password. Why the process is storing a recent logged on password? Because imagine when you log into a machine and a few minutes later or an hour later, you want to access some server, let's say a, a shared, a Samba shell, you, you don't want to be prompt again for password. So the, the password is stored uh, in LDAP, uh, sorry, in Elsas. And uh, um, and it prevent you from it prevent you for it's more comfortable for the user. It prevent it prevent you from being asked again to type uh, the password. Uh, like many things in in uh, cyber security, if it's more comfortable, some it's come with a price. The price that an attacker can um, dump the memory of Elsas and and look for the uh, passwords. Let's see uh, the attack. Yes, let's see that. Uh, now I'm going to use a very common tool named Mimikatz to show you the uh, attack. Uh, I just want to mention that I compromise here a username Alex, which is a normal account. Uh, and I'm just showing what how I can privilege es uh, do a privilege escalation and lateral movement to uh, all the domain. So with the following command, logon passwords, um, just a few words on Mimikat. It's a very common open source tool. You can type in, uh, in GitHub. I, I basically looking for uh, the recent logon password. You can see that sometimes the password is null. So a few years ago, Windows has an update. And the update uh, is hardened the, the password. You can configure it in the registry to check if you, um, to, to, to prevent the password from being shown. I'm going to look for another uh, type uh, uh, of password that is shown whenever uh, an attacker is uh, dumping the memory. OK. As you can see here, I found a clear text password. So as an attacker, I'm, it's kind of a, a success, a successful uh, um, attack. So now I'll try to log in, to log on to um, the domain controller, to sysvol uh, folder, which any users should have at least a read permission. So let's try to log on using the, the new password and username that I got. Let's just copy it. So this is the username. And the password is here. OK. I got an error uh, that Sysfall is not accessible beca for, because of a, a permission problem. So it's uh, the attack for the attacker, it was kind of uh, frustrating, frustrating as, um, as uh, I didn't manage to lateral move a uh, to another, uh, to the domain controller or to another machine. As you can see uh, here, you can see our, uh, in the presentation, you can see decoys in our UI in the product. It's here you can configure uh, your username, you can configure the password, you can see alerts. And in our environment, the decoys have um, what we call in deception, it's called breadcrumbs. What we do uh, uh, with the decoy user password we we inject them to places around the we just as a breadcrumbs as it's as it's as it sounds we put the password in uh, many places around the network with the hope that when an attacker do an attack he, he will use it and in this way we'll detect it we based our um the idea of deception it's the any normal user shouldn't be able to successfully log in to the decoy so for example, you can see uh, the password. Uh, we use the, one of the users here. And um, we will, uh, as you can see, it's one of the users. And we were able to uh, uh, detect it. Soon I'm going to show you the, um, 
the alert in our system. Before the alert, I just want to talk to you about the error code. So there, there might be two types of error codes when you access with the uh, credentials. You can, you can use a correct username but wrong password, or you can use the correct password. For us, when we know that uh, the logon was successful in terms of authentication, not authorization, in terms of authentication, we know that our breadcrumbs worked. So we can tell, and we tell in our product, the whole story of the attack. We, can, we say, listen, we, we hid a very specific password in a very specific place. For example, a memory, we, we put them in the memory of, of Elsas, a decoy password. The error we see here, it's actually a successful authentication, but we, the users, the decoy users will never have authorization. Using GPO, we prevent the decoy users from logging in remotely, locally, and uh, using LDAP just to protect uh, the assets. Uh, let's, see, uh, the, let's see the alert. We can see the asset. It's blurred, but it's an IP. We, what happened, which protocol? Uh, we say it's successful authentication. Why it's successful? Because the, the password was correct. But, Nevertheless, the authorization, uh, the user was, the attacker was prevent logging in uh, in terms of uh, authorization. The next attack I'm going to show, it's a user enumeration and password spray. So what is a password uh, spray? Uh, usually uh, in many environment, in Active Directory in particular, there is, a, whenever you try to log in too many, ti too many times in a very uh, small amount window of time, you will be locked out. So this is the opposite of, uh, of the goal of the attackers. The attackers want to be uh, to work as quietly as possible and not to be uh, detected. So password spraying is the process of, uh, of the attacker using maybe one or two uh, type of password, because usually the default GPO uh, in AD environment is five you can do, uh, you can try to log in until uh, five times until it's locked out, usually if it's not changed. And uh, I'm going to provide the tool, I'm going to show you soon the tool, uh, a list of very common names uh, of uh, in the English uh, vocabulary. Sorry, I just shared the wrong screen. Okay, so let's show uh, the attack. Okay, so before showing the attack, I want to show you that I have one file of users, as you see in the picture, and one file of, pass of password. And, uh, and for each uh, user, I'm going to try to... Uh, I'm going to try to uh, log in with this password. In addition, I'm going to check if the user is uh, is exist. So how the how the attack works? Whenever you uh, log in with a correct username, there's a specific type of uh, a specific type of response from uh, the domain controller. And whenever it's not exist, you will also have a specific type of error. In this way, the the attackers know. Uh, to find the to find the, the the users and to find and later on the password, so we can see here we found the following username and the following passwords. We found here, for example, and the uh, administrator password just by a password spraying. How we detect it? How we detect the um, the the attack? We use, again, a multi-layered um, defense strategy. A, a classic use of uh, log analysis of the domain controller is, is used in this case. We analyzed uh, if we have more than five failed authentication attempts in 15 minutes, and then if we have too much alerts from the same asset, we alert. By analyzing the... Uh, the event logs in the domain controller, we can see that we had 68 failed authentication attempts, 
with the following username. This is a, a one way to uh, detect it. Another way is to use MDR. In the same logic that the attacker is analyzing the Kerberos error codes, we also analyze the Kerberos error code. Whenever we see a specific Kerberos error code, which means user not existing, if we see too many of this, um, too many of these uh, error codes in a short period of time, we detect. So the idea is to mimic what the attacker does, just we uh, reverse it for the deception, uh, sorry, for the detection uh, view. Uh, the last attack I'm going to show is uh, DC Sync. Uh, what is DC Sync? DC Sync is uh, an attack usually used by two tools, either Mimikatz or the Python library uh, in packet. You can Google it and uh, look for it. It's an open source using Python. Uh, the attack is uh, targeting the ntds.dit file, which is the Active Directory database file. The database file stores uh, the password hashes of all the users and the um, computers in the domain. Password hasher, it's a lot, in a lot of attacks in Active Directory, the attacker is looking for the hashes because, because of the way Kerberos works. And a lot of times, instead of the, the password, the password usually doesn't, is not stored in a clear text, it's just stored in, in, in a hash. So this is a main target uh, for the attacker. Usually in a, a in a DC sync attack, what the attacker does is uh, is using a, a valid replication protocol. Usually in Active Directory, when you have more than one DC, you can log in. If you have if you're on the same domain, you can log in to any of these DCs. So this uh, domain control these domain controllers they need to be replicated and keep uh, uh, entries and objects up to date. So, for example, if I will change password in DC number one, maybe the back the backup DC also need to be updated on this password. So the the domain controllers will speak with each other. They use a specific um, type of RPC subtype of RPC protocol uh, to do it. Let's show the attack and then uh, let's uh, speak a bit about uh, how uh, uh, we detect. Okay, again, I'm gonna use a uh, Mimikatz. This time I'm using the admin password adjust. Uh, the, I'm, I'm using the admin of the domain because I got it from the password spray attack. I actually also got it from the care bossing attack uh, earlier. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna type, uh, Sorry, one second. We're missing here just some. Uh, wanna copy the attack? Let's copy the attack and and. So what's the what Mimikat is doing now is acting as a domain controller. Is using the replication protocol. Let's uh, stop it for a second. It's using the application protocol to ask for application data from uh, the domain controller. It basically acts as a domain controller, uh, but, if, but it's not a domain controller, it's just a, a regular asset. We can see, for example, uh, for Mark, we found the hash. After I found the hash, I, can, I will usually use this uh, file with hashes and try to brute force the whole domain. I have many other types of attacks from this stage, like a golden ticket and other uh, types of, uh, of attack. So how we detect this uh, attack? Um, we use, in this case, we, we analyze using our NDR product, the, re the replication protocol. Whenever we see a non-domain controller asking the domain, using the protocol for replication, uh, using it from another domain to another domain controller, uh, we, we say, listen, it's suspicious. It's highly suspicious with a critical severity uh, because uh, an, an, a regular asset in your environment, a regular, let's say, Windows 10, shouldn't replicate data. It's not a domain control. So in this case, we'll use the NDR. Uh, I want to proceed to the next uh, defense we have, 
So until here, if I'll summarize it, we showed all the attacks and defenses, all the defenses, whether it's deception, detection, using logs or NDR, it's under the category of detection. We have another capability that Chris talked about it, which is a, a, a Active Directory misconfigurations and issues. So it's kind of a prevention, it's a preventative measure to take in order to harden your environment. I, I gave a few, just a few examples. Uh, the first, uh, first section we have is uh, uh, about uh, misconfigurations, issues on the domain. For example, what is, your, what is your password policy? We analyze your password policy. Maybe you have a account locked out is only after 10 attempts. We recommend you to lower it to five. Maybe you have excess number of admins in, in uh, relative to the total number of users, which make it easier to, uh, to, to attack. Another two sections is the asset, which is essentially the computer objects and users. Another example is in unsupporting uh, OS. Uh, let's take, for example, if you have an old system, old system, let's say Windows XP, Windows 2008, are not supported officially by Microsoft anymore for uh, patches. So it make it very critical as you have many CVEs uh, each, each day. Um, Another two uh, 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 type of misconfiguration, if you have uh, maybe password in your this account description or your special uh, Kerb TGT account need reset. Another type that, that we have is for Kerber hosting. We can show you all, all the service users that uh, exist in the domain to, show, to tell you, listen, these users are vulnerable to Kerber hosting. Maybe you don't need all of them. Maybe you can reduce the privileges of them. So whenever an, an attacker grab uh, the users, uh, you, you won't have so much, um, so much uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel uh, free.